Hooray, all right. Uh, so there was a demo at the end of my section that, that I, it, it just got too complicated trying to figure out how to get a web browser to open down here and set it. So afterwards, if anybody wants to, to see it, just come and find me and I can show you my, our very primitive um, speech to text synthesis stuff that we're working on. Uh, so anyway, this is um, what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna cover the first two, which are just, so innovations um, in standards and then in automation and machine learning, uh, I define innovation as not necessarily the, the, the most bells and whistles of something, but rather um, things that, that technologies that, that either do something more efficiently or for lower cost or just make people's lives easier. So I have a pretty broad uh, definition of it as we'll get into. And then Alicia's gonna cover um, improving accessibility at JW Player, uh, and then we'll take questions. So just very quickly, oh good God, that's a big picture. Wow, s sorry about that. Sorry to assault you with, with that. Uh, so I've been doing this for a pretty long time. Um, since 2002, I've worked in digital media, uh, primarily in, in video technologies, video compression, uh, and HTML5 uh, video and, and audio technologies. Uh, I was a product manager for those things at Google for four years. And I also um, worked some on the web VTT standard, the track element in HTML5, uh, and those things. And now at JW, I'm um, the SVP of technology, so I'm working primarily on innovation standards, next generation uh, video intelligence technologies, as we call them. And then Alicia, do you wanna just- Okay, cool. Okay. I've been doing for this for way less time. As you can see, I've been doing this for three years. Um, but I currently own all of the video user interfaces at JW Player. And uh, prior to that, I own the entire player. So uh, basically, I don't handle a lot of the technology of the browser compatibility and the um, and standards of uh, formats anymore, but uh, all the video user interfaces. And yeah, I was a I was formerly a freelance developer and designer. That's how I got into tech. All right, great. So standards. I just wanted to quickly cover some some recent developments. So there's this whole sort of process at the W3C where specs move towards through different stages of of sort of maturity. Uh, for a number of reasons, WebVTT um, has taken a very long time to get through that process. But despite that, and I think this is one of the, the indications of how strong a technology it is, it is now supported in every major browser. It's supported in uh, EBPEG and WebW, WebM video containers, as well as the two major adaptive streaming technologies in HTML5, which are Dash and Apple HLS. So it's, it's very... The way we always looked at WebVTT is that it was critical for the success of HTML5 to have a very simple human editable, which is also important, um, and stylable, meaning you could apply CSS to it. This, this format for doing captions in HTML5, there are other standards for doing it. There, we th always thought they were way too complex. Complexity, in my mind, is not equal innovation. Just because you make something fancier and more complicated doesn't mean that it's that's better or more advanced. So we worked very hard. A lot of people worked for a long time uh, to keep WebVTT simple, text-based. There's no XML in it. It's not massively complicated. Uh, and we finally now, it's um, at this stage. The next stage will be an actual W3C recommendation. That'll happen in time. But this is a very major uh, milestone for WebVTT. There's a whole test suite now available um, in the web platform test for WebVTT. So this, for me personally, was pretty exciting because it's taken a long time to get here. And to that end, I would like to call out uh, and thank somebody. This is Dr. Sylvia Pfeiffer. Uh, she lives in Australia, but she's German by birth. She's the ed editor of the spec. This woman has worked on this. She, prior to this, she was also one of the original editors of the HTML5 spec. Uh, she's been advocating for accessibility in the web for a long time. She's worked extremely hard to make all this happen. So I just wanted to quickly thank her for, for all the work she's done on this. Uh, okay, one, another thing that's, that's just recently started at W3C is an, an actual community group for working on a, an audio description standard. So uh, this is the mission um, by Francois, who's the guy at W3C who is who's spearheading this. 
uh, an open, open standard file format for audio description. Uh, all the way from scripting to mixing to presentation. This is something that um, people have been talking about for a long time. It's, uh, it's very important, as we've talked a lot today about audio description. I think it's the next really important thing that, that needs to be implemented across the board for accessibility. We're now getting to the point where captions is becoming, if not, you know, rote, at least enough people are aware of it, that it's starting to happen in, at scale. This needs to happen next. As I said in the earlier presentation, anybody can join this community group. You don't have to be a W3C member. Um, you just go to that link. You can participate, contribute your expertise, your opinions, your experiences. We, we want everybody uh, to participate in this. Uh, CMAF is a the common media application format. This is another one of these kind of things that on the surface is pretty, not boring, but uh, right now, there are different file container formats for video. There are some that are used for HLS, which is an adaptive streaming protocol that Apple developed. There's another one called Dash that was developed by the MPEG committee. None of these things have been interoperable. This is very uh, problematic, to say the least, for accessibility because you know, you're do one browser is doing Dash streaming, the other one's doing HLS. The content producers and providers have to have all these multiple versions of everything. This, the goal of, of CMAF is to normalize all that, make one container format that will be readily accessible across all the browsers and in all the streaming protocols. Uh, CMAF supports both WebVTI and IMSC1. Anybody familiar with IMSC1? So this is a new, uh, well, it's, it's basically a profile of TTML, which is a, another uh, captions format, more complicated than WebVTT, but for OTT and other applications, IMSC1, uh, the requirements are a bit more complicated. That's why it, it has been defined. Uh, it also supports multiple audio tracks, so if we're doing multiple languages in the same file container and in the same adaptive streaming uh, presentation, CMAF will support all that. Uh, so there's an overview here. These slides, I think, will be circulated later. You can click there just to get a, a more detailed overview of it. And there's actually a demo of a video player doing captions in both Dash and HLS using CMAF. So there's no logic where you have to switch if it's this browser or that browser. It all just magically works because CMAF is, is designed to do that. Uh, so this, the, how many people are familiar with the web content accessibility guidelines? Great, that's very encouraging. <laughs> so there's a new draft of this. Uh, it's been 10 years, I think. The, the version two was 2008. Um, it's primarily the emphasis is on you know updating it for, for mobile technologies like touch UIs, orientation. Um, it's not, there's not really too much core video stuff in it, but I just wanted to call it out because it is a really important uh, milestone towards the next project, which is called Silver. This is gonna be the successor to the content accessibility guidelines. And that's in a sort of early stage of just definition, kind of defining like what, what they wanna do, what they want the next uh, WCAG to be. And if you want an explainer about everything that's that's new in, in 2.1, you can click that link. Um, so this, uh, related to that, so testing, you know, whether your site adheres to all the guidelines, it, you know, it used to be a very kind of manual process. You had this long document and you would read through and you'd have, there are now these pretty sophisticated tools for automating this and doing it in software. One was developed by PayPal, it's called the AATT. Uh, these are, uh, I, I called these out specifically because they're free and they're open source, which I try to advocate whenever I can. Um, and then the Axe Core is a JavaScript engine for doing uh, this in software. It's, it's more targeted for developers. So if you are a developer or if you have developers on your team, you can point them there. But then there's also a very cool browser extension implementation of Axe that you just, you know, you open uh, your browser, you go to your site, you open the Chrome DevTools in the browser, and then there's a button, there will be a button over our, on the left that says Analyze, you click that, and then it gives you this report of everywhere, and again, I'm embarrassed to, uh, whoop, does this pointer work? I guess not. You can see this came from one of our sites. We don't have captions and audio, for shame. Um, but that, I thought that was a good example of, of 
the kind of output you get, and it goes through every single one of the, the WCAG um, requirements and kind of calls out you know, where your site is not satisfying them. It's, it's pretty amazing how sophisticated this, this tool is, but also really easy to use. And then, again, programmatically, a developer could do all this, running it automated and getting a report and fixing things in software. But this is a cool one just to have a visual kind of you know, report to see uh, very quickly where the problems are. We touched on this a bit in the, in the panel. Um, and as I said, that, that, so voice technology, how many people here own one of these speakers? Wow. See, this, this never, it, for the last year I've been doing talks and asking this question and it's more and more. I now have two of them. I never really, <laughs> I didn't expect to ever own one of them because it's just, even being somebody who works in technology and has for a long time, still the idea of like talking to a, it just, I don't know, creeps me out a little bit. You know, and I always feel a little bit self-conscious, like talking to this thing. Um, but I'm getting used to it. It's getting, you know. So now even people, even companies like Roku are starting to do this. But all these companies are investing many, many, many millions of dollars in speech recognition, recognition technology, as well as the artificial intelligence, neural networks, all this stuff in the background that actually then, okay, it first interprets what you said and figures out exactly what you said in whatever language. And then it actually does the action. So you say, you know, hey, Google, turn up my music. Or, you know, you, it knows what you have said. Not only literally, you know, putting it from your speech into text, but then taking the action. So as these things become more sophisticated, the result, I think, is that automated speech recognition and transcription is going to just completely, it will be automated within, I think, a couple years completely. We won't need the step as maybe maybe not completely it won't completely eliminate the step of having human fact check it and make corrections but it'll be pretty close to to perfect i think just seeing how much better these technologies have gotten how quickly and how much these companies are investing in them um, so you know you can also have custom models that you can train the algorithm so it's not just this blanket like you know, it's gonna interpret all English or all French in the same way. You can actually have a model to train it for Louisiana Creole English X, you know, like very specific models to get rid of that kind of um, ambiguity of accents for, you know, like as we mentioned in the panel, like, you know, for a lot of speech recognition software, a Scottish accent is pretty challenging. Well, you can have a model to train it specifically for these kinds of vocabularies, accents, namespaces, whatever you want to call them. So the cost to the other angle of this that's starting to change, <coughs> excuse me. So again, all these cloud services like Google and Amazon AWS, IBM Watson, they're all starting to offer ASR and the costs are just, Kevin had a better diagram than I'm gonna have here, but um, so we've tested them all at JW. We started this project, as I mentioned, in 2015. We haven't tested Amazon yet. Um, we're gonna do that soon. So they all now claim that they can, that they're on par with, with human transcribers. The, the sort of magic number for this is if you can get a 5.9% error rate in your transcription, then you're, quote, as good as a human, because that's apparently what they claim the human error rate is. They all seem to agree on that number. So Microsoft now claims that they have a 5.1% error rate, IBM is 5.5, and Google claims 4.9. Now that's for press releases and blog posts where they say, we've done it, we've cracked it, machines have, you know, or have surpassed humans. But when you really get into it and you actually start testing it in very wide-ranging use cases like we've done for this, it's more like 20% for Google. 25% for Microsoft and IBM, which sounds like, you know, well, that's, that's still a pretty high number, but to see where it's come from, it's incredible. So this is not even three years because we started this, looking into this in pretty, you know, like late 2015. And at the time, the, uh, the sort of prices that we were getting for not only, I mean, very few people were doing purely machine uh, ASR at the time, but the ASR plus human, or there are still companies, many companies doing this, but the quotes we were getting is like, you know, 
about a dollar to three dollars per running minute of the video. That's not per, per minute the person spends doing it. So if you had a three minute video, that could cost you as much as nine dollars. Now, as I said, Jerome and I <laughs> were proposing to do this across a catalog of millions of videos. That didn't go over very smoothly. It was just, it was crazy. The accuracy we were seeing was, you know, 35 to 40 percent at best. A lot of the errors it was that, that, that they were making were horribly embarrassing, like really bad. Not just a little bit off, but just like completely way off the mark. So it was almost like a, not even a percentage accuracy. It's like a, I don't know, what is it logarithmic? It's like kind of gets worse by the worse the words are that it's substituting. Uh, we had to manually upload the files to all of them, so you had to have like some kind of WAV file or a raw audio format that you uploaded, and there weren't many APIs to do this. It was all pretty clumsy. It was slow, and then again, we had to like, we would have had to hire people to manually correct these things at which would be, have been way more expensive than even the one to three dollars per minute. So you fast forward to now, uh, I think the cheapest one, uh, if my memory is correct, is, is Watson, but that's where this number comes from. So now people me. are proposing to do this for as low as a penny per running minute. It's about 80%, as I said, accuracy. That's where you know, I said uh, for the best case in Google for what we're doing has been about 20%. There are tons of, of APIs and programmatically, you know, ways to do this in software now. At all, it's, it's again, it's like this app, which is called AVA. That's what I was trying to think of before, A-V-A, is, is one case of an app that's, you know, just doing this in, in real time. YouTube's doing it in real time. Um, as you upload videos now to YouTube, in certain cases, they're doing real time ASR on them. Um, and human correction is, I think, you know, Still required, but I don't think it's going to be for long. I think, again, within a couple of years, it's just not going to be necessary. Okay. I should have let you do this. <laughs> I always just that people are always like, you know, bullets are so like 1998. Can't you like? I'm like, well, I'm not a you know graphic designer. Or yeah, I was jealous of Kevin's. I was like, oh crap, it didn't include See? any screenshots. What do we do? I don't have any transitions. I don't have any like animations other than that one. So I mentioned this also earlier. We're starting to experiment with this, um, what uh, I've heard called automated algorithmic description. Um, so essentially what this is, is again, we're trying to figure out as much as we can by examining a video, not only the, the transcript of, of the audio that's in it, the, the spoken audio or whatever, but then OCR, image detection, uh, all these algorithmic ways to try to say, okay, well, what, what is actually, what's the context of this video? What is it actually about? Not just what's in it, like not just, okay, there's a, a tree and then there's a sidewalk and then there's a building. It's like, okay, this is about an office park or this is about a hospital campus or, you know, that's just sort of figuring about what the big picture is. The emphasis I've put here is on Exper it inventing. <laughs> Again, like I said, not, not good at slides. Uh, we're experimenting with this because, as I also said earlier, it's extremely hard to do. We're actually starting to make some progress on it. So for one example of what we would do with this is we would, again, analyze this video, figure out what it's about, what's in it, and then use that to construct a WebVTT file with audio description in it, and then you could also synthesize that audio description using web, the Web Speech API, which is a standardized web API that's now supported in um, all the major browsers, finally, all four of them. So what you could do is pass those, you know, as the video is playing in the Web VTT time codes, you're like, okay, at this time, play this audio description. You could do this end to end, all in software, all uh, doing using mach machine learning and AI. Our company is JW Player gets more down this road to this video intelligence products. Um, what, what our publishers want to do is use machine learning, AI, all these things to uh, learn about the content in order to personalize it for users. So you can say, you know, you liked this video or you spent a, a, a pretty significant amount of time engaged with this video. 
our all this algorithmic stuff that we've done indicates that you probably will like these five videos. It, it's much more than just what in the past have been kind of not very smart recommendation algorithms like, you know, a bunch of people watch this one, so we'll recommend it next. This is more like not only tailored to your tastes, but also just sort of magically um, figuring out based on your interests, history, other things, what you might want to watch next. And th this also goes beyond the classic kind of uh, bubble that people get into where, you know, you only end up watching videos about space or you might be interested in space, but that indicates that you're also interested in mathematics or in marine biology. There's these associations that you can start to make that are a bit smarter. So I thought, well, there's all this data and we're doing all these, well, why can't something be done with that for accessibility? Because as we know, not everyone has the same needs. Uh, so I started thinking about this predictive accessibility where, um, and again, this is still <laughs> obviously not very fully baked, but I wanted to maybe in the questions get people's thoughts on this. Or w So in other words, being able to not only predict um, somebody's disabilities, but based on pre pr the way they've interacted or used assistive technologies, primarily for the web, because that's where my expertise is, how can we better help them in a, in a kind of automated, smart fashion? So that's the, this is the theoretical version of the future. My section is a little bit more self-promotional uh, in terms of JW Player because I'm gonna be talking to you about things that we did at JW Player and are gonna do at JW Player. Um, and when John asked me to talk with him, I was like, well, is it really innovative what we're doing? He was like, you know, sometimes innovation isn't the new and the latest and the greatest, but just doing something that nobody else is doing but maybe should be doing. And so I want to talk about, uh, also a lot of the content we've heard today is, is about the content like captioning and subtitles and about the content itself, but I work on the software of the video player. So that's what I'm talking about mostly right now. So at JW Player, we're constantly one of, known as one of the most accessible players out there. In fact, I think 3Play Media did a webinar, I don't know when it was, because there wasn't a date on it, with Accessibility Oz. And they reviewed a lot of players, I think there were 10 of them, on a bunch of different categories, and JW Player consistently ranked at the top of uh, all those categories. Uh, but I think we have the opportunity to be the best player out there on the market. And I say that because all of the top video players in their own different ways have ways that they deviate from the standards and the guidelines, um, but each of us do it differently. But at JW Player, I think we're very committed to correcting our mistakes and making sure that we are conforming to standards when we find out that we're not. And one good example of this is in um, 8.4, which is currently in beta, but will be available within the next week or so. We changed the way that um, users using a keyboard interact with our menus, and all of the arrow keys work to navigate a menu as you would expect in web accessibility, and the tab, we were overusing the, the use of the tab key, and now it has its own real meaning in how to navigate a menu, so we changed that up. And we also fixed some critical bugs that we found in JAWS that it, the player wasn't super accessible via JAWS. Um, you would have had to use a mouse to kind of get it started. Uh, so that wasn't good. And, um, and then we also just improved the user experience with things reading uh, things out properly in JAWS. And so speaking of JAWS, I think maybe I'm wrong in this, but in my surveying of other uh, video players, nobody else documents their official support of screen readers, so we did that very recently, and we documented our support for JAWS, NVDA, and VoiceOver, and I think that covers basically the whole market, minus a couple percent, according to the WebAIM surveys. Um, so we're really committed to improving our testing capabilities with screen readers, and um, you know we're really open to feedback in terms of if there's something about our player that doesn't conform to a standard, or there's some problem with a screen reader. So, and of course, just to note, our support of these things is a pairing of the the version of the screen reader and a, 
appropriate browser with appropriate version and an operating system, for example, JAWS not really being super supported in Edge, so we're just focusing on IE 11, for example. Um, but that's on what we were, we are recently doing, but now I want to talk about something that we're going ahead and doing in the future, which is automatically localizing players, and I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar with the term localization, but I just thought I'd refresh your memory if not. So localization to me is just customizing any default text, and um, that can be like tool tips, ARIA labels for screen readers, menu options, whatever. And we see publishers doing that in two ways. The first way is just overriding defaults in English. So like let's say they don't want it to say play, they want it to say play now, or instead of replay, they want it to say play again. So they're only gonna do it for a couple of fields. They're not gonna do it for every single field. And it's mostly based on personal preference or branding, things like that. And it's definitely not required. And then we see publishers doing a full translation. There's more than 25, if not 30 something, and eventually there's gonna be like 50 something, different things that you can customize in the player. And so you'd wanna do all of those if you were completely translating into another language, unless like full screen is full screen in your language too, but you're gonna wanna do a full overhaul. And so at JW Player, we're really lucky. We have a really big network, and a lot of those are foreign publishers. Unfortunately, not a lot of those foreign publishers are translating their players in specific. And I was really confused about that, so I went and talked to them, and I found that there's three major reasons why people aren't localizing their players today. First is because it takes some time. Person A has to uh, translate it, and then person B has to review it, person C has to implement it. You know, there's a little bit of friction there. Second reason is maybe they don't even know about our full offering. In our platform, we have a player builder, which is a really non-technical way of customizing a player. And on there, we only expose about five or six localization fields, whereas if you implement it fully in custom code, you can have access to every single one. So maybe some of our publishers only see that and they think, that's all I can localize? Great, I've done that. Um, other publishers who are very self-guided they might not even know about our localization documentation. I think we can improve that, but you know, for one reason or another, they're not doing it. And lastly, I think most importantly, is they don't realize how disruptive it is to the user experience. And I think that makes sense, given that these are people talking to JW Player. We're an American company. We speak English, so they already probably speak English. They're at least bilingual, if not multilingual. And maybe they don't have a lot of experiences with not being able to access something because they can't understand it. So it's understandable. But I interviewed some of my colleagues <coughs> One of whom I remember was, uh, she's French, and she told me how her mother doesn't speak a word of English, and her mother's computer is always littered with viruses, with problems, with things like this, because she's just clicking randomly around the screen just to accept a dialogue or get X out of something, whatever, and it causes a lot of problems, so we know it's a really big problem. So our vision is this feature called intelligent localization. And what that, that's gonna do is it's automatically going to translate the player into matching the website that it's embedded on. And there's gonna be no code required. You're not even gonna need to turn it on because it will happen out of the box. And originally we'll probably roll out with about 12 different languages and over time we'll probably expand that based on um, the needs of our customers, but uh, I think that the languages that we're going out with initially are gonna cover at least 80%, if not more, of our customers. Um, and then for those customers who really do wanna customize anything, or maybe we don't offer the, the language that they want initially, they will be able to log into our dashboard and they will be able to customize every single field. And for the customers that use our platform to deliver all of the players to their site, um, it will be really, really easy, non-technical to fill that out. Um, but of course, you'll still be able to do it in code too. Um, so I think what this is gonna result in are millions, if not billions of views where viewers are seeing a player in a language they understand where it was never like that before. And as JW player grows and as our customers grow, it's gonna be really frictionless and it's gonna really improve the user experience.
Yeah, it, well, it, yeah, this has always been tricky because, y you know, a lot of content, the, the, you know, the canonical language, for lack of a better word, of the film or whatever will be, let's say, English. And if there are people in it speaking Spanish, that's burned into the video, you know, and then you end up with, Netflix has a lot more control over that stuff, for the, especially for their original programming, because, you know, they don't have these kind of old archived masters of, of films that just have always had that stuff burned in. Um, I, I don't know necessarily how to solve the particular problem that you're talking about, where you end up with this collision between audio description, but it's sort of an, a type of audio description and the actual literal translation of the, the words. Um, I don't know. They, I'd they, say first it would be ideal if the publisher were aware of that and they could um, in, I believe, 608 and 708 captions, uh, which I'm not sure applies to uh, a subtitle, but you can position the captions. So if on the publisher side, they adjusted the position of the captions and they knew their media had it burned in, then they could totally avoid that. The player itself doesn't know what's there, although maybe that's a way that we can use machine learning in the future is to detect that and avoid that collision automatically. Um, and another thing I know, YouTube does allow you to drag the captions around the screen. I think it would move up if you had a collision, and that's something that we could also look into doing. Regions in VTT will, yeah, that, was, that took a very long time. To, it's one of the reasons it took seven years, because, yeah, this, it's very, uh, yeah, the positioning, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote proper way to do this is if the, a Spanish speaker on the right of the screen and the English speaker on the left, or, you know, you, you, you have the region of this one here. And you don't just put it all in the center as the old 608 type, you know, where everything was just, you didn't have any context as to who was speaking unless you actually put a little, you know, Sergio says or something in it. So that's the way that the regions are supposed to help with that. The uh, Able Player Project, which uh, Terrell Thompson was involved with, had an interesting solution for that problem because you get content where there might be something that, as part of the content, there's information about the speaker that's on the screen below. And the player doesn't know that, can't adjust. So they've found a way to uh, have, the, when the captions turn on, they're expressed below the frame of video, just below it. In a very similar place, Ours so it's like sitting there right bleed, below it. And that resolves the problem of it ever having conflict with what was residing on the bottom of the visual image itself. It's an interesting approach, alternative. Yeah, it's an interesting interface accommodation you'd have to make. Yeah, which is one of the nice things, again, not to overdo it, but, but, but WebBTT is very nice in this regard because you doesn't have to be in the video player. You can put, you know, render it outside of the player. You can render it up in the corner. You, you know, it doesn't have to be you know, st bolted on to the player, for lack of a better word. But. So there's one more. How would you compare your accessibility features to Able Player? No, thanks. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember. Um, well, there's, I'd say we're pretty great across the board, but what I'd say is that a lot of people are looking for scale and for solutions that aren't specifically tailored toward accessibility users, but work for them too. And um, I was talking to a customer about some of the accommodations, some of the ways that they could customize their player to work well with things like high contrast mode and um, different things like that. And I suggested these things, and they were like, well, wait, we don't want to have everybody experience the same thing if they turn it on. We just want to have it be working out of the box. And so what I would say is that JW Player has um, solutions that are tailored for accessibility users, but also work for everybody, if that makes sense. So it's not specifically for accessibility. And that way, we're, we're much more full-featured. I mean, we have things that go well beyond accessibility, of course. 
Zar. So I had a question about um, individuals that create the content or I guess shooting the videos for it, I guess, of a speaker. Like, um, are there any, I guess, informative information? Like, because I feel like if you're recording something, you have to also rethink now of how to do it in an accessible way where you can actually have the boxes on the bottom or you have to keep that in mind that when you're shooting this video, you're gonna have a box on the side that might actually block some of the image that you know you might miss out on. So uh, I guess do you inform others or that are creating content or getting video recorders to learn about that process? I don't know, maybe John you have, but I'd say we don't, but we, we tend to deal with a lot of very um, enterprise and very, very large customers that have been doing this for a really long time. So uh, they we like to say we, we cover the technology and they do what they do best, which is make content. So I'd say in that way, we don't tend to inform the content as much. Yeah, no, I mean, this is also a, a classic problem in that the color background, this is always like, do you use yellow text? Do you use white? Do you, it always bleeds in. This is why the out of player thing is so interesting. Don't put it on top of the video. <laughs> put it under, or when you're in full screen, you know, you, m almost all content nowadays is 16 by nine aspect. So you always have a letterbox. Don't, don't stop putting it over the video. I, said, I haven't really thought much about this. Thank you for, <laughs> for bringing this up. So yeah, you, instead of having to dictate to a director, which trust me, they are not gonna be like, yeah, the hell with you and your captions, I need to, you know. Um, don't put it on the video, just put it under or put it in the letterbox or maybe this is just, we need to have a fundamental rethinking of, of and this would be an area where it'd be interesting to get people's feedback, people who are actually using the assistive technologies. Like, would it be a bad experience for you to have it in the letterbox instead of on top of the video? Or would you constantly have to be looking up and down? Like, these are questions that, that we, I think we need more, you know, research and, and just use user interviews and, and investigation into it. But cool. Well, mm -hmm. oh, are we are we out of time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yeah, we're both uh, here all day. So if you want to catch up with us, I I'm here all week. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it's again another old showbiz joke. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. This is really important work, and. W3C, participate. You don't have to be a member. That's my <laughs> W3C plug, so thank you.